Welcome to Fantasy Booking Warfare. It is time for the final matchup of our preliminary round. Ollie, Luke, and Tempest have all advanced to the semi final. But now we must learn who will be the final man to make it out of the mud and into the spotlight. Pete Quinnell, Laurie Blake. Who will score one lucky punch and who will get dumped in the bin like an empty bottle of Prime? It's time to find out as they try to book Logan Paul, WWE Champion. I'm Dave Bradshaw and for the past 15 years I have been a play-by-play -play commentator in British and European wrestling. Off the top, missile nice. dropkick! Can he get it? Yes he can! He's yeah. the champion of the world! I am the master of the half crab, the current reigning undisputed British heavyweight champion, Michael Oku, and who better to tell you how bad things are booked than me? I'm Nina Samuels, star of The Nina Samuels Show, and here on Wrestle Talk, because of course, Wrestle Talk needs more Nina. Today on Fantasy Booking Warfare, we are planning for how Logan Paul could become WWE Champion. And first of all, we're going to see how Pete Quinnell would make that happen. You guys ready? I am so ready. <laughs> Let's have a look. Yeah. So, there is one tiny bit of admin before this booking begins. At WrestleMania 39, Cody Rhodes finished the story and he beat Roman Reigns. He just did it, okay? I'm not sorry about it. It just makes the most sense. Cody then immediately splits the belts with the Universal title going to SmackDown and Cody keeping hold of the WWE title. Cody then defends his belt against Brock Lesnar at Backlash, Seth Rollins at Night of Champions, Finn Balor at Money in the Bank, as well as some title defenses on Raw against Chad Gable, a debut in Carmelo Hayes, and after Money in the Bank, Ricochet. Meanwhile, Logan Paul, following his loss to Seth Rollins at WrestleMania, entered himself into the Money in the Bank match, and at one point looked like he was going to win, but was thwarted by Ricochet, leading to a perfectly non-botched Spanish fly through two tables on the outside. Following Cody's successful defense of the WWE Championship against Ricochet, Logan Paul comes out to face down Cody after the match, saying that the only reason that he's not Mr. Money in the Bank right now is because of Ricochet. If it wasn't for him, he'd have a title match whenever he he wants, and now that Ricochet's at the back of the line of challengers, it's Logan's turn for a title shot. Cody humors him, saying that respectfully, he's not a professional wrestler, and this is a professional wrestling championship. He's got talent for sure, but he's not a professional wrestler. Logan responds by saying that he doesn't need to be a professional wrestler when he's a global megastar. Cody fires back, saying that the love he feels for professional wrestling runs through his blood and is what helped him earn his title. He loves professional wrestling so much that when he left WWE, he started his own promotion. Logan just sees this as promotional material. But if he wants to learn what professional wrestling really is, then sure, he can have Cody teach him a lesson at SummerSlam. Logan Paul then beats Cody Rhodes at SummerSlam. But of course, he won't be winning clean. He only gets the win because of interference from his brother, Jake Paul, who debuts at SummerSlam, knocks Cody out after a ref bump with that one lucky punch, and Logan crawls over for the pin. Logan Paul is your new WWE Champion. This establishes the new duo on Raw, Logan and Jake Paul, and they are absolute dicks about it. They come out week after week on Raw and establish that professional wrestling is a dirty term. They're not professional wrestlers, bleh, gross, they're global megastars. The side plates on the WWE Championship aren't for Logan, they're prime logos. He wears the belt upside down, back to front, he takes it on his podcast and hands it round like an accessory. He shows it no amount of respect. They get interrupted on one episode of Raw by Logan Paul's first challenger, Johnny Gargano. Gargano says that he's wanted to be a professional wrestler since he was a kid. Wrestling means everything to him. He's even called Johnny Wrestling, and he wants the belt to be back on a professional wrestler once again. A match is made for the following week's Raw, which Logan retains due to, once again, Interference from Jake Paul knocking out Gargano. Another wrestler steps up to the plate. This time, it's Chad Gable, who talks about his entire history of amateur wrestling on top of his professional wrestling career. Logan responds with, You competed at the Olympics, but you didn't even win a medal. All you've done since is try to find something to replace that failure because you're not a global megastar like we are. Once again, Logan retains. This time though, Otis neuters the Jake Paul interference, but the distraction is enough for Logan to take a swig of Prime, spit it in Gable's face, 
and hit the one lucky punch to retain. The pair continued to be obnoxious the following week's Raw before they're interrupted by the undisputed tag team champions, Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. The two talk about their history about how wrestling was the thing that bonded them for life, the thing that made these two soulmates find each other. It's a thing that drove them to be champions, and it's the thing that's finally going to make Sami Zayn a world champion on the WWE main roster. The two attack the Paul brothers, stand tall, and the challenges made for payback. Sami Zayn versus Logan Paul. During the match, it's slightly different this time. Logan keeps trying his usual high spots, the big crossbody to the outside, the buckshot lariat, a big springboard 450, and Sammy keeps countering all of them. He always outmaneuvers Logan and grounds him with technical wrestling. Logan grows more and more frustrated until he gets his opening from Jake on the outside, who distracts the referee and allows Logan to take control with a thumb to the eye. Kevin Owens runs down and equalizes Jake, running him out of the arena, but Logan catches Sammy with a low blow, hoofing him in the dick, and then, obnoxiously smiling all the while, locks in a Fujiwara armbar, and Sammy is forced to tap. On Raw, Owens is irate, his best friend being cheated out of being a world champion on the main roster for the first time, so he demands a rematch on behalf of Sammy, as his arm isn't healed enough to fight. The match is made, and in the main event of the show, Logan Paul puts his title on the line against KO. Once again, KO is out-wrestling Logan, putting him in all sorts of holes that he doesn't know how to get out of. But behind the referee's back, Logan takes control after a thumb to the eye. In the finish of the match, KO throws up Logan for a pop-up powerbomb, which is countered by Logan on the way down into a knee strike. KO bounces off the ropes but fires back going into the stunner, but Logan grabs his arm as he sits down, spins him around, and locks in the Fujiwara armbar once again to force KO to tap out. Logan and Jake continue to be dicks. The next time Logan defends his belt, it's at Fastlane, and winning a fatal four-way to determine the number one contendership is AJ Styles. On Raw, Styles confronts Logan, saying that I've been wrestling for 25 years. When I had my first match, you were three years old. And in all that time, I've never seen anyone show as much disrespect to that title as you have. You've got so much promise, so much natural talent for this, but you're wasting it because your brother over here keeps telling you you've got to be a global megastar when you could be one of the best professional wrestlers in WWE history. Logan seems to falter slightly, but Jake talks back, saying that AJ has been wrestling for as many years as he is old, and yet he and Logan have accomplished more than he ever has. You see Logan give a quick look to Jake, almost a flash of annoyance, before he backs him up, saying that AJ has never had what it takes to be a global megastar. In the match at Fastlane, once again, AJ is just out-wrestling Logan, getting him in holes that Logan doesn't know how to get out of, and you can see Logan's frustration building. Later in the match, Styles locked in the calf crusher, and Logan is writhing in pain. Jake Paul tries to run interference, he reaches his hand through the ropes, trying to pull Logan to safety, but Logan stares back at him. A look of calm comes over his face, and he shakes his head at Jake before he reaches back for AJ's head and locks in a headlock, forcing AJ to break the hold, which Logan transitions into a guillotine choke and then transitions into a Fujiwara armbar, forcing AJ to tap. He won, and he won with professional wrestling. Logan and Jake celebrate, but Logan looks at Jake uneasily. On Raw, Logan and Jake come out once more to celebrate a successful retention, and after more of their usual shtick led by Jake, he turns to Logan and says, you know, it's so great, it's so great you're still champion, it's awesome, but like, why didn't you take my help? Logan pauses, but before he can answer, they're interrupted by this. Imperium walks to the ring, looks of concern across both the Paul brothers. Gunther steps up to them at this point, having beaten Honky Tonk Man's record with the Intercontinental Championship and dropped his title to Sheamus in an awesome encounter at Fastlane. Gunther says that what Logan has done to the WWE Championship is disgusting, and any time he steps into the ring, he is tarnishing its legacy. He is not a professional wrestler. Logan and Jake try to talk back, but they are immediately taken down by Ludwig Kaiser and Giovanni Vinci and placed into submission holds, not applied to do damage, but just to tie up their legs and arms. Gunther steps over them and leans down towards Logan and says, I will rid the WWE Championship of your infection, and once again, the mat will be sacred. Imperium walks away, and Logan looks uneasy, not even able to maintain eye contact with Jake. The following week, there's a match between Logan Paul and Giovanni Vinci, the man who applied the submission on him last week. And behind both the referees and Logan's back, Jake Paul uses Logan's belt to hit Vinci. Logan wins with the one lucky punch, and afterwards, Jake can be seen telling Logan what he did while they celebrate. And Logan goes from jubilant 
to pissed off. He walks out, Jake walking half a pace behind him. The week after, it's Logan Paul versus Ludwig Kaiser, but during this match, Jake Paul goes to cheat again, because it's all he knows. But this time, Logan sees him, shouts at him to leave, which he does. But Ludwig hits a huge running uppercut from the distraction and pins Logan Paul. After the match, Logan, furious, locks in a Fujiwara armbar onto Kaiser. On the go-home show, Logan calls out Jake, angry that he cost him his match last week. Jake gets in Logan's face, saying that he needs to sharpen up, use his head, we need this belt, all right? This is how we stay being global megastars. Logan fires back. No, he says. We don't need it. You do. You need me to hold this belt because without me, you'd be nothing in WWE. I'm the one doing all the work. I'm the one fighting. I'm the professional wrestler. They both stop. A look of shock on both their faces. Jake shakes his head in disbelief, places his mic onto the mat, and walks out. Logan, still shocked at what he said, watches as his brother walks out for Gunther's music to play. He stands on the stage, smiling, as Raw goes off the air. At Survivor Series, it's Logan versus Gunther. Logan, on his entrance, seems more focused, has a lot less flashiness. He just walks to the ring, and the match begins. Logan, during the course of the match, holds his own in the technical aspect of wrestling, matching Gunther in holds and counters. At this point, having learned everything from the other wrestlers he's faced on his journey here, Johnny Gargano, Chad Gable, AJ Styles, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens. Gunther locks in a sleeper hold, but Logan wrenches at the arm and counters it into a Fujiwara armbar, which Gunther manages to escape from, but not before sustaining heavy damage. For the rest of the match, Gunther has to chop with his weaker hand. Later in the match, there's another armbar in what looks like it could be the end of the match, but Gunther manages to power out of it into a powerbomb. Logan gets to his feet and Gunther bites the bullet, chopping Logan with his stronger hand at great detriment to himself and hits the big splash off the top rope for the one, two, three. Gunther is your new WWE champion. After the match, Gunther celebrates and shakes Logan Paul's hand, a mark of respect. Logan shakes his hand, a look of dejection on his face. He leaves and isn't seen in WWE until the Royal Rumble. And when he comes back, he's still a heel, but he now has a technical edge to his wrestling repertoire. And that is how I would book Logan Paul as WWE Champion. Okay. Um, I can see pros and cons here, but Michael, what are you thinking? I really like Global Megastar versus professional wrestling. The fact that we've got like how he wins it, how he loses it, I thought that was like well told. And I'm just thinking about how the fans would hate each bit as we go along. But yeah, yeah, I thought it was, it was well told. Logan Paul to me works best as a heel. No one hears social media influencer and thinks, yes, love that. Pins Giovanni to Vinci one week. The next week, Ludwig Kaiser gets the win, the pin on him. Yes, that does happen. And that seems to not mean anything for Ludwig Kaiser. So. Gunther gets the title match. What about mm -hmm. what about Ludwig Kaiser champion there? The WWE champion. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. Ludwig Kaiser should, in theory, be ahead of the line. That's where I've got a question with. That doesn't really make sense to me. Yeah, I think the way that, that Logan and, and um, Jake are presented is exactly how they should be as annoying heels who are full of themselves. When Logan Paul wins the championship. That is a major mainstream moment of attention yeah. for WWE. Yeah. If you're the company, you want to keep that momentum going by having the first challenger be someone very, very high profile. And no offense to Johnny Gargano, who I love, but I'm not sure he's the pick for that. Because surely you want something where the mainstream media are going to continue to report on you know, a Brock Lesnar or a whoever you can get right, who's, who's, you want to big names. You want someone where yeah. they already know the person. I think that I have an issue with the the story them going to being about the Paul brothers, about mm -hmm. Logan and Jake having dissension. Yeah. I think instead of Jake Paul, you have the fans to bounce that off. Is Jake the guy to be the foil mm -hmm. for Logan there? If he's is the global megastar, he should want a Brock Lesnar. Roman mm. Reigns type championship schedule. So I don't True. see that he would be wanting to prove himself. Doing all the media interviews maybe, but not necessarily turning up yeah. to the show. He probably literally can't as well. He probably is just literally yeah. that busy. Yeah, yeah I think I see it as that 100%. thing. So especially like if he's using it as an accessory, mm -hmm. he's spending all of his time doing like every podcast, it. every media interview, but he's not turning up. And if he's turning up, he's just turning up with it as an accessory not defending it. So I feel like it should really be the battle of the fans are like clamoring well, for him to defend it because he hasn't. I mean, it'll be interesting to see 
when we when we talk to Pete, yeah, if he can justify will. some of those things that we have some uh, some concerns over. But we'll move on. Yeah, we've got uh, another. And we're going to see how Laurie would book the same thing. So this is Laurie booking Logan Paul as WWE Champion. Right. Logan Paul as WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Do I have to? I mean, nobody wants it. Nobody what? Nobody what? Can I book? Can I book something more enjoyable? Like how I'd feed my nads into a threshing machine, the agonizing slow death of the heat universe. You know, oh no, I'll put the video. I oh, know, I know, I know. Anywho, couple of things. First of all, the WWE Championship technically doesn't really exist anymore, so I'm going to do the World Heavyweight Championship instead because that's more fun. And two, to set the scene for my booking existential crisis, Kendall, named Logan Paul, joins WWE's Mojo Dojo Casa House in June 2022, just like in real life. This is after, of course, making his appearances at WrestleMania in 2021, getting stunned by Kevin Owens, and teaming with and being betrayed by The Miz at Mania in 2022. From there, things go as you would expect. He still faces Roman at Crown Jewel in November and loses. He returns for the Rumble and gets his big old spot against Ricochet. He gets into the feud with Rollins, costing him the match at Elimination Chamber and eventually losing to Rollins at WrestleMania. Now this brings us to Money in the Bank in dear old London Tan, where Paul once again without qualifying is ended into the ladder match, much to the annoyance of everyone else who had to actually, you know, fight for their spot. And just like in reality, during that match, Paul is sort of the whipping boy and the foil for this host of Triple H faves. He's the boo to the yays for Butch, Shinsuke Nakamura, Ricochet, Santos Escobar and Damian Priest, and he's the boo to the yeah for LA Knight. I will say that him and Rick don't botch the Spanish fly spot in my booking because we might as well tidy up while we're here revising <laughs> history. Now the climax of the match once again teases LA Knight's big moment. He fends off assaults from Butch, Escobar and Nakamura and starts the slow ascent, only to be caught in a chokehold by Damien Priest, who then slams him to the canvas, jumping off the ladder in the process, buckling to his knees as he lands. So far, so like real life. But this is just as Logan Paul vaults the ropes and hits Priest with a curb stomp, essentially stepping off the back of his head onto the second rung of the ladder and rapidly climbing to the top. A quick pause to have a smug smile into the hard cam as he gets to the top because no one is standing to challenge him. He then unhooks the briefcase and Logan Paul is Mr. Money in the Bank. But that moniker doesn't last long. Because later in the show, as Seth Rollins faces off against hometown hero, if we forget about, you know, borders and history, Finn Balor, Paul comes out to ringside briefcase in tow. Now, the presence of the internet's biggest dickhead manages to play mind games with both Balor and Rollins, who are collectively thrown off their games, being distracted by Paul on the outside, hesitating before hitting their finishes, giving the other the chance to counter. And finally, Rollins gets the upper hand, knocking Balor down and lining up for the stomp, only for Paul to slide the briefcase into Balor, which comes to a stop directly beneath his head. Now, there's a momentary hesitation on Rollins' part that gives Balor the chance to move out of the way of the stomp as it comes down. Rollins' foot slams into the briefcase and he crumples to the floor, holding his ankle. Now, Balor seizes the opportunity, climbs to the top rope and comes crashing down with the coup de grace. One, two, WHAM! Balor is rocked by a springboard diving punch from Paul, who scoops up the briefcase, hands it to the referee before stacking up Balor and Rollins for the pin. One, two, three, and new WWE World Heavyweight Champion, Logan Paul. It's the darkest timeline, it's the darkest timeline. And yes, John Cena saying that they would bring WrestleMania to London might now be the only way to win back the UK fans. You're going to have to do it, guys. So, on the following Monday's Raw, Logan Paul makes his entrance to a chorus of boos and he is being a dickhead turned up to 11. He's plugging his podcast into the camera. He's swigging from a bottle of Prime. He gets on the mic and he says, Don't think I didn't hear you on my way out. I get that you're unhappy. I get that you think I screwed Finn Balor out of an opportunity he has had owed to him since he had to vacate the Universal Championship. And I know that you think that I did one over on Seth Rollins, the guy who put this company on his back time and time again. And that's the thing, you can call this what you want. You can say that I'm undeserving. You can say it's the new heist of the century. You can boil it all down to just one lucky punch, but I know the truth. And the truth is that I'm the WWE World Heavyweight Champion in my first year in this company without years of training. I made moments talked about on social media by millions of people, and I didn't have to spend years grinding away on the indies to do it, and that just eats you 
guys up. It eats you up that WWE could see my natural talent, that I came in at the level I deserved to be at, and that I turned out to be better than you thought. Better than Knight, better than Balor, and better than Rollins. And I'm willing to prove it. Because anyone who wants a piece of the champ, any former indie darlings who think they've been grinding away for years without being given an opportunity to go big time, now's your chance to take your shot. It's the, the bullet bouncing sound. It's a ricochet. Because out walks the one and only, and he lays down a challenge for Logan at SummerSlam, saying that he is just as athletically gifted as Paul, and he's made just as many moments shared by millions on social media, and the only difference is his most viral moments don't leave him having to make a public apology. <laughs> So Rick is going to take the heavyweight championship off of Logan before he does something to disgrace it. Now the match at SummerSlam is the expected spot to palooza with Paul and Rick matching each other move for move, flip for flip. The only difference being the minutes of showboating between each athletic marvel from Paul. Now in the closing stretch, Ricochet runs to the ropes for his springboard moonsault, but mid-air Paul clocks him with a surgically repaired hand with that 40 millimeter metal screw in it and goes straight into the pin. One, two, three, Logan Paul retains the World Heavyweight Championship. And Logan continues to leverage his unnatural advantage over the coming months, beating Kevin Owens at Payback, Sami Zayn at Fastlane, and Johnny Gargano at Survivor Series with variations on the knockout punch. Indie darlings, all oh, bam, bam, bam. Then we reach the Royal Rumble, and who should enter the match at number one? But young Codicious Rhodes, the previous year's winner, a man with a story to finish and someone who has toiled for years to get any sort of opportunity in WWE, which is why he's not winning here. Because Cody goes the distance, he finds himself in the final few even after a particularly vicious beating at the hands of Gunther who is out for revenge for the previous year's upset. And the countdown starts as number 30 is about to come in. Out walks Maxwell Jacob Friedman. Ooh. A man whose contract with AEW came up in January 2024 and who has said repeatedly that he will go to the company with the deepest pockets come the time. How are we going to beat a dickhead like Logan Paul with an even bigger dickhead? So how you beat a kaiju, you get another kaiju. But dicks. Cody looks like he's seen a ghost as his former protege swaggers to the ring. Both men work to throw the last few entrants out until it is just the two of them and then we finally get the Cody and MJF face off. Now Cody shaking himself out of his stupor does the honourable thing and offers his hand for MJF to shake, which he does, but he swings his leg for Cody's nethers. Only to be caught by a quick thigh squeeze though because Rhodes Ain't falling for that one again. That means the brawl is on with Cody gaining the upper hand and looking for crossroads, but MJF manages to fight up back to his feet and then he mule kicks Cody in the plums. He then picks him up, he hits his double cross before winging Rhodes out over the top rope. Pointy, pointy, signy, signy. MJF is in WWE and MJF is going to WrestleMania. Majef then appears on Raw to address which title he would like a shot at at Mania. And he says that not only is he someone who's worked his ass off to get into this position, but unlike Zayn, Owens, and Ricochet, he's a once in a generation talent. He's better than all of them. And he's better than Logan Paul. He says, Logan, I'm more athletically gifted than you. I'm more talked about in wrestling than you. I make more money doing this than you. I am all around better than you. And I'm going to prove it when I take the World Heavyweight Championship from you. Now over the coming months, the pair exchange words, culminating in a contract signing just before Mania, which inevitably breaks down into a brawl, and sees MJF continually locking Paul into a clinch, just like Logan did in his boxing match with Floyd Mayweather. Because even when it comes to annoying the fans, MJF is better than you. It's WrestleMania, baby! Woo! And Logan Paul versus MJF hits the ring. It's the clash of the dickheads. And it is exactly as you would expect. Two gifted athletes putting on a showcase of their skills with plenty of shithousery in all of the moments in between. There's dirty tricks and deeds abounding from both guys in the run-up to a finale, which sees Paul gain the upper hand, finally lining up for his one lucky punch. But MJF slips something out of his trunks. A diamond ring. He slips it onto his finger and he swings a counter punch. Their knuckles meet in the middle. Explosion! The world shatters. Or at least, 
Logan Pauls does. As he crumples to the ground, holding his hand, screaming in pain, as if the metal screw in his hand has shattered in the process. MJF quickly chucks his ring, locks in the salt of the earth, bending Logan Paul's hand back as he does so, and Logan taps. MJF is the new world heavyweight champion. Logan Paul's reign of terror is over. And we never have to talk about it ever again. We can just wipe this from history, delete this video from the internet, and just never talk about it. This was a waste of 10 minutes of my time, and as the four exercises go, it was a bad one. I didn't enjoy this. I didn't enjoy having to do that. It was not fun. All right, bye. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it. I respect the, the going out of the, the, like, you know, the MJF thing, like, Something I didn't see coming, as in like, yeah. yes, yeah, actually, yeah. let's That's really push out that. the boundaries. It's a cool and like, moment, cool rumble moment. Yeah, 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 100%. And also the whole, like, let's have Logan Paul beat all the indie darlings. Let's just really anger the fans, the yeah. hardcore fans, especially mm. as much as possible. Although it's the same problem in a way, is that it's it's not really facing yeah, the a high Yeah, the same problem as the, la as, as yeah. the last one, yeah. Although I guess with this one, it was spe they're specifically put in that position for the purpose of it being the mm. indie darlings, not mm -hmm. just people who happen to have been put in that position. I like the way he's winning. Like, I think the money in the bank is the perfect way to me that he should win the championship. Exactly. Yeah. If you had to say classically, well, what what sells a big high profile WrestleMania match more than dickhead versus dickhead? Like, it's not really, is it? You know what I mean? Mm. A, a heel versus heel dynamic where it's like, yeah, you want Brock. It, you uh, want, yeah, I mean, I want <laughs> you want. I, I want either. I want either someone very well known, or I want someone who's so likable. You know, in contrast to Logan Paul being so unlikable, that that's the dynamic. It's almost like they're trying to out heal mm. Logan Paul. Both. Yeah. Of them. Is it? Are we really building? We're making Logan Paul more and more unlikable month after month after month to have him beaten by someone who is also unlikable. Not sure. I, I would. I would need it justifying to me, I think. Yeah. I think like, that's it. I think that's which it. I think is exactly what we need. Yes, so, I think so. Uh, on that note, guys, you want to bring uh, Pete and Laurie in? Pete's joined us. Hello. Laurie's joined us. Thank you, gentlemen, both of you, for your efforts on uh, how you would put Logan Paul uh, as WWE Champion. We're Why gonna... is Michael already writing? It's he like... just he likes to take notes. <laughs> I'm just trying my pen okay. out. It's a <laughs> yeah, yeah. bit faint. It's a bit faint. Just thought we've got a chance to like make Come a case. Yeah, yeah, really fair. Michael's already no, writing yeah, names. Yeah. yeah, that's not fair. He hasn't even had a chance to defend himself. Yet. Yeah, I don't like the way you were kind of pointing right. towards me when you said that. Well, it's funny you should say that, Pete, because oh, we're coming yeah. to you yeah. first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We looked at your your version first, mm -hmm. so we, we we have some questions. Okay. Talk us through your your logic on how the rain begins. Uh. Think of the heel heat, brother, is essentially it. Cody finishes a story, right, at WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, Cody can have a decent little reign. He's got a good, good few defenses on Raw and at pay views and stuff like that. It's a solid reign, but you don't need a massive long Cody reign because he, the, the thing is, he's won it. That's Cody's story. He has a solid reign. It's not a bad reign. It's not a short reign. Logan Paul wins when no one expects it. Think of the heel heat, brother. Oof. Heat. <laughs> now, talk us through your thought process behind choosing Logan Paul's first few opponents. I think that, on the surface, he is a very good sports entertainer. He's, a, he's very naturally gifted athletically in the ring, but he might lack a, a slight technical edge to his offense, a subtle psychology of things he might not get. You had Johnny Gargano as the first one, right? He sure did, okay, yeah. Talking away specifically Johnny Gargano mm -hmm. the first one. Because Johnny Gargano, in current 2023 is not the huge megastar that he was in NXT. He's kind of just a guy currently, which is a shame. I love Johnny Gargano, wish he had more, but currently he's mid to lower card and he can mm -hmm. cut that fiery promo and say, I'm Johnny wrestling and he can get over the wrestling aspect of it. Okay, so Logan Paul's just won the championship. Yeah. Which presumably is a massive mainstream moment in terms of media mm. attention yeah. for WWE. Mm. and. In order to maintain that momentum mm -hmm. and to try and keep that story in the news, yep. you've gone for the next opponent to be someone who, by your own admission, is just a guy. On Raw, not at the next pay-per-view. So you're within a pay-per-view, you're going to get a guy from just a guy by, by him just saying, I'm Johnny Wrestling, to be the number one contender for the WWE Championship. Yeah. That's how Dwayne it works. Johnson. On, a, on a Raw. On a Raw, yeah. So Stone Logan Paul Cold. is doing his first title defense mm -hmm. 
On Raw. On Raw, absolutely, yeah. Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. It makes perfect sense to me. Think of the narrative. Okay. Johnny Wrestling. Yeah. That's enough. Okay. <laughs> Write that down. Yeah, I'm writing that down. Yeah. That's the narrative. Again, this is no shade to Johnny Wrestling. Just no. a, 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 from our perspective, it's mm -hmm. a choice. Yeah. As a first. Yeah. No, it's not about his talent. It's about how yes. he's been presented mm. over exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you said it. The J Jake and Logan as the the power duo of WWE. That's your mainstream appeal. Their opponents, while it fits for the story and the narrative for when Logan does lose the belt, it's not the primary source. You don't need to be getting the clicks because of his opponent. It's not that that's going to draw it. And when Gunther does eventually win, that is still going to be a big deal because he's the guy that finally dethroned Logan Paul down the line. Do you remember? Do you remember Ronda Rousey's just last women's title ring? No, because it was bad and it was poorly booked. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, poorly booked. It was poorly booked. <laughs> <laughs> Because um, it didn't make any sense. There was no story what, her, to her it. Her opponents, or yeah, her opponents. The just way they were weren't up to snuff in terms of someone who had such a mainstream appeal coming in. <laughs> just kind of as she was there longer, mm -hmm. it just went down, and people mm -hmm. stopped watching. Mm -hmm. Speaking of things that didn't make sense, uh huh. Leon Logan Paul beats Giovanni Vinci. Mm -hmm. Then Ludwig Kaiser mm -hmm. beats yeah. Logan Paul. He does. Where's his title shot? Uh, you don't get an automatic title shot, not in my world. Not in this fantasy book. You don't get a title shot just for beating pinning the champion. The champion? The WWE no. champion. Pinning the WWE no. champion? Triple H. Absolutely not. Vince McMahon. Uh -huh. Jinder Mahal. <laughs> uh -huh. That championship. That championship right there. Yeah. You do not get a title shot. He, you know what? He could challenge Gunther afterwards. Makes perfect sense. It's a really good thing you can't see these notes. Yeah, they seem quite extensive. Um, quite nervous. The good part about this, I think, is that you do a good job of presenting Logan and Jake Paul as the assholes mm -hmm. who everyone ha wants to hate. But essentially, you're spending most of the title reign establishing that Logan Paul is very unlikable, mm -hmm. and you can't wait for him to get his comeuppance yeah. at the hands of you know, the conquering hero. Mm -hmm. And then you've chosen a heel. He would turn babyface as part of this. Okay, Gunther so would saying, be babyface. So this, would, this, be, this yes. would be how he turns? Yes. Do you think that's risky? Every time he gets to the ring, everyone's like, oh, this guy is amazing, please let us watch him more. People will be ready to cheer him. If WWE presented him as a babyface, people would absolutely cheer him. I completely agree. I thought you were talking about building to a title match between Logan Paul and Jake Paul, because what you kept referring yeah. to was looks. They keep looking at each other, looks, looks. And mm -hmm. finally, Jake Paul kind of turns on Logan Paul, mm -hmm. leaves him for dry. Mm -hmm. So were you not accidentally booking a feud between Jake Paul and Logan Paul that never happens? Hey man, they, they could totally do that. You know, I only had 10 you, minutes. They, you. <laughs> so you're blaming the parameters of the competition and blaming production mm -hmm. for this. It's a bold move. I'm just saying that they can totally do that without the title. Mm. That feud does not need the belt. And this was about the title reign. So you're Jake. a booker who's not really responsible for the booking. The title reign. No, no, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and Logan Paul's still the heel. So if Gunther's the babyface, that yes. means Logan Paul is still the heel. Still the heel. Point, despite the fact that he's wanting to prove himself and how good of a wrestler. He has a sympathetic he edge, is. yes. But he's not a babyface. Is he a tweener? You could say that. <laughs> <laughs> he said it. He said it. No further questions. <laughs> okay, moving all right. on. I've had enough. Mm. Um, Laurie. Hello. First of all, what was interesting to me was was that you said you wouldn't do this like, in, mm. a, in an ideal world, right? So, yeah. Um, so before we get into what you chose to do, why is it, just out of interest here, uh, that you actually think this is a bad idea to have Logan Paul as champion? Uh, because, well, I just think he's trash, mostly. Um, I think he's irredeemable. He continually f***s up over and over again, and he's would be someone who would probably bring disgrace to the championship pretty quickly because he would do something outlandish. I mean, he's literally in WWE right now embroiled in a quite large bit of backlash about prime energy drink. Sounds right? like good heat, right? Hey. Think of the heel heat, brother. The heel heat, brother. That's what I'm saying. Right. Well, that's what we're using when we have booked it. <laughs> Nobody wants it, but I booked it. You choose to have him win Money in the Bank uh, and go on the same night, right? To, yep. to cash in the money in the bank. Why that as a way of making Logan Paul champion? Because it's cheap and it's opportunistic. You want it to be cheap for him to win here because I want it to feel like the whole the whole point of this story is he's saying the whole time I've got this natural talent, I came in at the level that I was supposed to be at, but actually 
he's taken the easy way out every single time. Why did you go MJF? Well, mostly because I just thought, who would be the biggest dickhead? An even bigger dickhead. Is that's the only way to do it in my head. And I think the, the thing with MJF is he's always teased um, coming across the WWE if the money's right. I feel like it seems like the next logical step for his career. And I think Logan Paul, you can do a kind of a wrestler rises up through the ranks and beats him or someone who's just on the, the right side of good comes in. But MJF is an option here. He gets to continue to just be the MJF character that everybody loves to hate. And he's against the perfect person to do that without actually having to go babyface here in this scenario because everyone wants to watch Logan Paul fail. So you're essentially saying it wouldn't be heel versus heel. It would kind of be babyface versus heel. I think people would receive MJF as babyface. Yeah. But I think he could continue to be the heel character. He could still slag off the crowd. He could still, as long as overall it all loops back into Logan Paul and taking him down, I mm. think people will be on his side regardless. Do you not think that then a better challenger or the person to actually dethrone him would be someone that people would know for sure is going to mess him up, like, like Gunther, for example? I think I think that's a, yeah, a very valid point. I just wanted to go in a different direction. Ultimately, I thought this was the more interesting and appealing story to me personally. I do think the kind of the obvious choice would have been a Gunther or somebody like that, but that's not what I wanted to do. I think that's given us quite a lot to think, think about. So um, sounds like sounds like MJF would be a tweener in, uh, in that story over there. Just uh, uh, I, won't be, he, I don't think he'd be acting like one. Though. I think he, <laughs> some people might receive. Some people who you know say the word tweener might receive. I didn't, him I like didn't a say tweener. the word. You, you I said some that. people would. Didn't say I would. You said it earlier. Let me stop. Let me stop using that word, please. In the interests of Michael's health, I think you both need to yeah. stop saying the word tweener. Please. Uh, and what we're going to do instead is what we have done with all of these quarterfinals, and that is to have each of you give a final closing statement as to why you think it should be you who goes through to the semi-finals. I think that in modern wrestling, you look at like the Bloodline story, you look at MJF and Adam Cole, what people want are these rich characters who have a coherent story that people can buy into week on week. And this is a story of Logan Paul learning wrestling. It is a coherent story from start to end, and it would make for more interesting characters by the end of it, and it makes Gunther a star. Well, first of all, can I just say, Nina, big fan of your work. Michael, huge fan of your work. Dave, I'm always impressed at how many Monster Energy drinks you can drink in a day. Um, my story is obviously a different direction. Um, nobody wants to see Logan Paul succeed. This is a situation in which you can use him to foster as much heat as possible to then bring in a new star and put them over huge. This was this is all a launch pad for MJF, this entire storyline. I refuse to give uh, Logan Paul any semblance of humanity, any, any kind of like the villain learns to be good. Keep him a villain, that's what people want to see. They want to watch him fail. Let's have him fail in a really big way against an even bigger dickhead. I think uh, we've heard enough. If you two could both just um, sit and contemplate what you've done. We will also sit and contemplate who we think should go through to the semi-final. We've made our decision, and first up to reveal his choice, Michael Oku. Thank you, thank you, Dave. Um, my choice, I, I think this is one of the most interesting ones to do. One of the most interesting things to book. Um, so much so that, as it was happening in real life, I was kind of fantasy booking myself. Like, what would I do if Logan Paul were to win the WWE title? And so I think I honestly just went with something that was closest to what I would do, as well as one that really decides to be adventurous with the uh, with the fantasy aspect. So that is why I choose not. All right. Both of these are flawed. <laughs> um, there's not. I think we discussed this. They're <laughs> not perfect. Let's face it. But you know, perfect perfection is not what we're looking for. We're looking for a, a general vibe, a general feel. Um, and for all of our harsh questioning, I think both of them did have, have their strengths as well. Overall, it comes down to who I think uh, tells the better story in the middle. Uh, and despite my misgivings about some of the choices of people to fill different roles, I've gone with Pete. 
This was a very difficult decision um, because I didn't like either of them, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Neither would be how I would have booked it. Um, I think there were some massively missed opportunities. Um, so yeah, it was just a case of which one I disliked less. Pete, yours had probably more bits in it that I liked, but also more bits that I disliked. So, in the end, I went with Laurie. Which means that Laurie, you are advancing through to the semi-finals. It is uh, no, not another one. <laughs> and we hope you will find a scenario that you love just as much as you've enjoyed this one. Oh God. Um, Pete, you've ended up on the losing end. Your, your thoughts? Ah, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. Bl blames the production. Everyone girl. else is wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blame My story is great. Yeah, Everyone sure. would love it. If only you'd had longer than 10 minutes. I know, yeah. right? Right. Yeah, Laurie, let's hear your victory speech. Well, as I said, Nina, Michael, always a big fan of your work. Dave, you've obviously had too much monsters, Dave, <laughs> but the correct man won. Yeah. And with that scathing review of poor old Pete, Laurie Blake becomes the final entrant into the semi-final round of our tournament. Half the field has been eliminated. Half gets the opportunity to prove their worth once more. Join us next week as the second round begins and we find out just who is the least terrible booker of fantasy wrestling. Only on Fantasy Booking Warfare. Thank you guys for Thank taking you. the time to book the Hardy's retirement. And we've decided we're going to approach this differently to how we've approached some of the other episodes. Okay. Unlike in some other cases, which will remain unnamed, neither of these were disasters. <gasps> Tempers, we did it! So <laughs> <laughs>